Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Lucio, and now let's get on with the show. When things go sideways, will you be prepared? Some people are concerned they might have to go for a long time without electricity or even food. That's why I want to introduce you to 4Patriots.com. Get preparedness products you can use now and that could save your life later. My favorite is 4Patriots' new solar generator, the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. It uses the endless free power of the sun to power lights, your TV, medical equipment, even run your fridge. Plus, it's expandable and comes with a free solar panel. Or pick up one of 4Patriots' best-selling survival food kits. Delicious tasting and designed to last for 25 years. They even have kits with real meat. And if the power's out, no worries. Just boil water over a fire, simmer, and serve. You'll enjoy a hot meal and stay safe in a crisis. More smart people than ever are finding 4Patriots. Over 2 million customers trust them. And you might have even seen them on TV. I had the folks at 4Patriots set up a special page for you at 4Patriots.com forward slash drive on so that listeners of this podcast can see this week's discounts and deals before they go away. Go to 4Patriots.com forward slash drive on, but hurry, these deals won't last long. Save more and get peace of mind now by going to 4Patriots.com forward slash drive on. From a small Pennsylvania Bible college to the jungles of Korea and the burn pits of Iraq, my next guest, Jeff Circle, is a veteran author, and award-winning journalist. His journey from serving in the Army to living in the U.S. Virgin Islands and beyond is a roller coaster of experiences, and today he's going to join us to discuss his mission of getting more veterans into writing. Uh, so before we get into that, I want to welcome you to the show, Jeff. Uh, really glad to have you here. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be on. Yeah, you bet. Um, so, Let's take it back a bit, um, and I kind of want to talk about your journey and how you got to where you are right now. Um, so you initially joined the Army Reserves um, and then later transitioned into active duty. Uh, I know a lot of people who've done the opposite. They, they started off active duty, and, and then, you know, at, as time went on, they, they decided, uh, you know, I'm getting too old for this shit kind of thing. <laughs> and they decided, uh, let's, I, I could still do it maybe part-time, but, um, you know, tell me about your your time in in getting into the army and uh, what prompted the change uh, to go active duty? Well, like you said, I, <laughs> I was going uh, to Bible college in Pennsylvania and needed some extra money and it was mostly for pizza, but <laughs> someone said, Hey, this might be a cool thing. And then I saw Top Gun, kid you not. <laughs> and I was in and I went to the recruiting station, went to the Navy first, you know, like a little jackass and I want to do that. And, um, the guy looked at me and said, no way, kid, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and so I went to the army and the army dude was, oh, yeah, you want to you want to do something? Oh, army reserve. Yeah, we've got something for you because, you know, I can't be a pilot as a reservist. You know, I'm like 22 or something. And uh, so joined the army, got uh, got into my reserve unit a couple months. And then they shipped me off to basic training in Fort Dix, New, Fort Dix New Jersey in April. So I was there April, May, June. July. Oh, terrible. And terrible. then when I picked a job, my recruiter was slick. And all you recruiters out there, listen up. You got a thing. You've got a list of jobs and they're all like, oh, you can be a truck driver or you can be a mechanic or you can, you know, you can join the infantry or all these other things. And then he picks up a clipboard and says, oh, intelligence analyst. I don't even know what that is. I don't even know what they do. I was like, I want that. <laughs> so uh, I, I went off to Fort Huachuca in July. August, September. So the bottom of Arizona in the summer, it was fantastic. Oh my God. And that's awful. believe it or not, yeah, it was awful. And when I got back, I said, I want to go back and do that again. I want more of that. So it was the dumbest thing in the world. Basic training in AIT in the army made me want full time. And my unit said, Hey, we just paid for all this training. So you've got to stay here for six months. Ended up going active duty as soon as they let me. I said, What's the first date available? And they said, April 4th. And I was on the bus April 4th. <laughs> so that's wow. how I went. Dumbest thing. But it was the greatest thing. Yeah. You know, and it, it's kind of like um, almost like that unknown situation where, 
you go into it and even the recruiter didn't know what the hell, uh, you know, you're getting into and you, you go into it, not really knowing what it's all about. Um, I had no plan. I had no plan. Yeah. I, I, cause I, all I knew is I wanted to be a top gun pilot. And they said, yeah, forget that. Right. And when he said Intel analyst, and then I kid you not, Scott, this is his exact words. Uh, I don't know what they do. That's some James Bond shit. Oh, nice. Was, oh, that, that's on, that's a secret sauce right there. Like that's gonna I, get I'm in. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you went, you went from going from Top Gun to James Bond, and I don't know. I mean, they're pretty. Both of them are pretty cool, you know. So I, I don't, I don't know that the, it's like you got second best in that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I listen to Jack Stewart. I, I see him on on interviews, and I've met him a few times. He's a super guy, and his stories are great. And my stories aren't as fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's starting off that way. It's starting off pretty fun. Um, starting off pretty fun. There I was sitting in the field. <laughs> yeah, no shit. There I was. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, anyways, so you you make the switch to active duty, and you served uh, during the Gulf War time period. Um, Did what was that experience like? Anything notable there that you you could uh, share? You know, so many things, Scott, in life are better when you look back on them. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, you know, active duty, I signed up. What I decided, well, let's do something weird. I don't want to go to Fort Bliss or Fort Polk. So I went to Korea for my first year. And that was eye opening. And I loved it. And I wanted more. Ended up PCSing like normal. You get to do your year and go back to the States. Ended up at Fort Hood. And within a year, um, yeah, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And they said, <laughs> you're going. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I was I was in an armor unit. I was in uh, General Patton's second division, Hell on Wheels Armor Division. And uh, we were in the first Tiger Brigade, and they didn't send the whole division. They just sent the Tiger Brigade. And so there I was. He's sitting in Saudi Arabia digging foxholes, and uh, that was amazing. And so I'm digging foxholes and, and working out of a, a, a tactical operations center, which is four armored vehicles they back up together and roll out tents and you're walking on plywood floors and hope that you don't get you know stung by scorpions and all this <laughs> stuff and every night i was i was the i was the nco in charge at night so i worked from uh midnight to noon and i'd look up there were the pilots <laughs> Because if you remember, if you know your history at this point, because I'm old, you got to consider it history. Uh, they they just bombed the hell out of Iraq for, for months before you know, they said, OK, Tiger Brigade, go. Right. Uh, so they're always looking up at my Top Gun pilots. <laughs> digging all, the guys, all the guys that you wanted to, to be. And then you're, you're digging the foxhole. So maybe you did get second best in that. that Where, where's my tuxedo and my martini? Where's the James Bond? Yeah, James well, Bond did not have an e-tool digging a sho shovel <laughs> or uh, digging a, a foxhole, you know. No. So, you yeah, know, we rolled and uh, it was it was amazing. Um, I, and I finally embraced it because at first we were we we were we were prepping back at Fort Hood with all the intel guys. And they're like, Iraq is a serious army. They've been at war. They're experienced. They're battle hardened. They've been at it with Iran for eight years. These guys are used to it. And we're like. Yeah, we, we sit in a skiff, <laughs> you know, so um, we, we at first we were a little concerned, but then after we kind of broke it all down uh, and Schwarzkopf, you know, kind of put together a super plan, it was, yeah, let's roll. And so, you know, we ended up going over the border and that was, that was a fun 72, 96 hours. We, uh, we cleared some foxholes because uh, <laughs> as, as we found out, they were guys on the other side digging foxholes too, but their foxholes were so much cooler than ours. There's like little caves. They had so long to, 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 to build these. It was, we went down into this, this complex. And I remember as one foxhole we went into, this guy, you know, this, this Iraqi, uh, got called up probably at the last minute and said, you're going to the front line, son. And uh, walked in, you know, we, we're clearing it all out. And he had a shelf built into the foxhole. And there was, uh, there was, there was a little sterno thing going. I mean, he had a tea. It was still hot. Uh, <laughs> there, there were some books. And, and there, there was a small book. It was, it was a calendar. Every year, a calendar. And I'm flipping through this thing. Because we're looking, actually, we're looking for any kind of intel we can get to at that point. And I uh, remember there was a picture uh, of four 
people, two men, two women. The men were military aged, and I could see in the background there was a, a sign that said Bank of Saudi Arabia in the back. And uh, I just thought about those people, like, you know what? They got called up. They're probably on vacation, and they took this with them to war. And, you know, what happened happened, but uh, they were people too. And I walked away from that with actually a really good experience. It's served me well since I've left. You know, and it, that's an interesting perspective to have too, because a lot of times when we go to war, and this is generations back, this is not just a, you know, a more recent phenomenon, uh, we tend to dehumanize the enemy that we're fighting against, right? We, we come up with, with uh, derogatory names for them, and we, we think of them as less than human, maybe, but really they're you know, they're soldiers just like we were. Um, they, they had families, they had, uh, you know, hopes and dreams that didn't include, uh, you know, a, a rifle and, you know, all of that other stuff. Right. They, they had, they had all of that just like we do. And, and so we, we kind of forget about some of that stuff, but on the Intel side, I got to imagine you see the more human side of things, uh, a little bit more than maybe the infantry guys who are like, like I was, who just are looking at, you know, this, this little silhouette on at the end of your rifle, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and the, the, the humanity of it really hit home even more to where I can still visualize it today. Yeah. And it's a long time of the Mutla Ridge. This this gap in between Kuwait city, the really the only main road out and, uh, you know, the 10, you know, warthog pilots and all this top gun guys, you know, they, 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 they blew that place to hell. And uh, we were tasked to go through that afterwards and, you know, find survivors or, you know, there was, there was, there was the, you know, dead body detail and that just really, you know, kid from Pennsylvania or from Ohio, but, you know, kid from college and then all of a sudden thrown into that um, saw, you know, things that stick with you. One of the things that I remember the most was how the materials that we were going through were Kuwaiti property, um, civilian cars loaded down with stuff that all these soldiers stole mm -hmm. and they, they took over when they went to Kuwait city. And I mean, household goods in P in personally owned vehicles that belong to people in Kuwait civilians and all these Iraqi soldiers were trying to take it all out. Yeah. And, you know, they, they got bombed at the begin at the top of the, the, the gap. And so everything else was a pot shot. Uh, that humanity has stuck with me too. And you're right, Scott, you're right on. I mean, they're, they're people too. Sure. Um, and just like, just like all of us and Russia and China, you know, none of us really hate the Chinese or the Russians or the Venezuelans. It's their governments. It's, it's the people who are in power, who are exercising policies that, you know, are, inhumane to, to, to a lot of things. So, you know, we don't, we don't hate people and we don't want to have to, you know, do what we do, yeah. but you know, politics are what they are, you know, people at this level say you down here, go do this. So it's exactly. We're supposed to do. Yeah. And, and like a good soldier, you're going to go fo follow orders and um, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's just kind of the, the nature of the beast. And unfortunately, and, and uh, we, we have it here, they have it there. Um, you know, it's, it's just interesting, uh, as you're talking about the, um, the vehicles, the personally owned vehicles from Kuwait being in I Iraq and, uh, you know, loaded down with all the personal information and stuff or, or uh, personal household goods. Um, it, it reminded me of a time when, so when I was in Afghanistan, um, we would see a lot of vehicles driving around with American license plates on them. <laughs> and I mean, there is. No road. I've looked on maps. I've tried to find it. There's no road that gets you from the United States <laughs> to Afghanistan. So it's not like Americans are just driving around. Hey, let's check out what, you know, our buddies are doing over here while they go off to war, you know? So <laughs> something's up with my trip advisor. I don't know. <laughs> I know. Right. Jeez. It's, it's crazy. So we, what we ended up doing, we ended up stopping any of the vehicles that we saw with American plates on them and we took off the license plates and we, we kept them. We had a whole wall on our fob that had all these license plates. We must have had a hundred of them, um, all, all different states, a lot from California, but all, I mean, all across, uh, even some Canadian ones. We were like, screw it. We'll take those too. They don't know the difference. Um, <laughs> so, so we took them and I ended up 
tabulating all of them and, and put them in a spreadsheet. And I contacted uh, the California State Police and I, yeah. I sent them a list of all the, the license plates and said, hey, the vehicles that were once associated with these, I got to imagine they were probably stolen at some point. You can close out a ton of stolen vehicle <laughs> cases just by looking at this spreadsheet. Um, wow. And what I, the response I got back is, yeah, probably 90 plus percent of those those vehicles were reported stolen. And uh, what happens is they the cars will get stolen in the U.S. They get driven down to Mexico. They get put on a boat shipped over to Pakistan and then they they'd sell the cars as is license plates yep. and everything. But one of those vehicles, I opened up the glove, bo- glove box and it had receipts. It had uh, the, like the registration. It had all Trading these you. things. I, I was able to look and I like, I could see this, this person, they lived in, you know, somewhere in California that had their address, their name, all, their phone number, all these things. I was able to look at it. It was like, talk about humanity like this is like tying yeah. directly to a specific person um you know and and it was just a a strange way to think of it because it, before it was just like oh we're collecting license plates this is kind of funny you know yeah. but but now it's like actually this was some some dude's car that got stolen and he's probably pissed about it um and here's know, but, his- and oh, here's a, here's all his information i probably could call him and be like hey by the way your car's in afghanistan right now <laughs> <laughs> But, well, it probably ended up on a container in the port of LA, like within hours. You know? I know. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. It, and I mean, they, they drove those things and they, they got pissed at us for taking the license plates. Cause they, it was kind of like a, um, almost like a fashion a accessory. Like they, they thought it like, this makes our car look cool. Like by having this license plate, you know? Well, here's the other thing too, with that is if it gives you as a shooter, just a half second hesitation, you know? Hmm. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. And wow. you know, that, wow. that could be, that could be a good or a bad thing, um, depending on the situation, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a great story. Yeah. I couldn't believe what over in Afghanistan, you just look across, we, we were at this one fob and climbed the mountain behind it, uh, got up on the tower and we're looking down with, with optics. Couldn't believe all the, all the Toyota pickups. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. The old, the highlights. So, yep. Yep. So many of those. And it's like we, we get sometimes not, no offense, but we get these Intel reports and like, yeah, they're driving a white Toyota. Like no shit. So oh, is everybody awesome. else, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Tan Corolla. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll narrow it down. It's like, like finding the, you know, hot blonde in LA, like <laughs> everywhere you turn. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so uh, so you transition transition out of the military. Um, what was that experience like for you? Uh, and you you know, know, getting out, yeah. And- after Desert Storm, and after I was disillusioned with the whole James Bond experience. <laughs> <laughs> First year in Korea in an armored uh, in an infantry division, uh, then an armored division for another couple years. Then then you know Iraq and Kuwait. Um, I, I'm like, hey, I've got to do something different because this yeah. intel thing isn't working out. So I. I was, uh, they cut orders for me to go to the Fort Hood CID office. And so we're going to make a special investigator. And, you know, after this six months OJT program that we're setting up to bring in new agents, we'll send you off to the school and you can be a CID agent. Like, okay, that sounds great. That's fun. I grew up watching cop shows. I always wanted to be a police officer. So I'm going to do that. And it worked out really cool. Uh, because all of a sudden now we're in civilian clothes, get to shed that uniform and kind of drive around. It wasn't doing PT. It's, you know, five 30 in the morning with the, with the guys. And, uh, I get, I get tied up with, uh, this, this unit, uh, at CID and the guy that they put me with was a great dude. Loved him. We got along great. Uh, the whole time he couldn't wait to get out. Yeah. He's like, oh, I can't wait. I wait to get, wait to get out. I'm going to go be a real cop or I'm going to go, you know, be, join the FBI or do something. Like so, you know, still being young and dumb and just like, you know, trying to soak up as much as I could. I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to go do that. And so at the end of the, the, the period I had, I had, uh, I had letters for OCS. I had letters for CID or I could have reenlisted and done whatever I want. I could go in another direction. And I decided to get out and I thought, well, you know, I'm, combat vet you no know, who 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 here's been a kuwait no nobody me i've got all this experience so i'm gonna go be a cop 
And so what every good soldier does out of Fort Hood, Texas, is they drive about an hour south down I-35 and end up in Austin. And uh, Austin was, it's like, uh, back then it was the live music capital of the world. It was still weird. It wasn't crowded. It was fantastic. Yeah. So I went down there and I'm like, hey, I'm going to be an Austin police officer. So I went through the whole process. And uh, polygraph, physical, psychological exam, uh, all kinds of just assessments and uh, everything. Get down to the very end. My recruiter says, Jeff, your packet is is the best we've ever seen top secret security clearance top physical shape you understand you know weapons and you understand people you understand the psychology of all this with your intel background you're gonna be you're gonna be great i get in there i'm like okay great this sounds great i walk into a panel interview and i hadn't had a panel interview since korea uh when i when i when i went to the board to be an e5 and uh sat down and i was feeling pretty good about myself and I was feeling too good about myself. And they said, you're not the kind of person we need. Mm. So that was, that was the moment right there where that transition really hit me in the face because for the last four or five years, I had always had a green army ID card, took that everywhere, used it for everything. I didn't have that anymore. I didn't live on base, but everyone around me was military. You know, you live on a, on a, on a, on a post little town, you know, Copper's Cove or Colleen or Fayetteville, whatever. And everyone around you, you have things in common. You're, you're a group, you're a team, you can trust everybody. You, you have a connection to everybody. And now I'm in a town where I don't know anybody and I don't have any connection. I don't have that support system. There was no internet. So it wasn't like, Hey, I can just, or there wasn't cell phones. I couldn't just text a buddy. I couldn't, you know, read a blog and, you know, what other people were going through, anything like that. It was just all on my own. And that was a really tough period transition. Like, well, what do I do now? Yeah. And so what, what got you, <laughs> so what got you through that? Like what, you know, there, there wasn't any of those things that you just mentioned, uh, you know, yeah. the, the technology that we take for granted today, uh, you yeah. know, we, you can just, you know, you, you, you just jump on Google and, and find your yeah. answer in you know, less than five okay. minutes, you got an answer right now. Uh, back then, I think people forget back then. Um, that was not the case. We, we didn't have that option. No. Uh, well, I needed a job. I, I had this thing. It was hunger. It was, I needed food. And so, uh, I'm driving in my car and I pass a sign like a, like a yard sign on the, on the, on just on the road, come to work for MCI. And MCI used to be a phone company yeah. uh, that was like really big with it competing with AT and T. And back in the day, I know I keep going back in the day, but um, people used to call you at home and say, "Are you happy with your long distance service?" Yep. And so uh, MCI was uh, a lifeline for me because it was it was a team environment. It was we are all in this together, and it was enthusiastic. And it was, okay, we're going to train you. And then this is your mission. And this is what you have to do. And I was used to that, that structure. And uh, it, it was clear, sit there. And the first job I had was inbound, taking phone calls from customers who needed help or, or you know, they would call the number they saw on their TV. And it's like, oh, yeah, I can get a free month of long distance if I switch to this company. Yeah. And working there was so much fun. And I loved it. And so I had a team back. And it was great. I did that for five years. Um, I got off the phones after a year and I, I got promoted. I was a supervisor. So I had 16 people working for me who made phone calls. And that was fantastic. I was, I was back to being the, 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 you know, the squad leader or the, you know, I was, I was the E5 and I had yeah. my, I had on my whole, you know, platoon of privates here and they were, they were knocking it out and everyone was making money. And the money was, well, they used to call it MCI was money coming in. <laughs> because uh, it was it was lucrative and it was it was it was relatively easy, but you you needed a high energy level. So I had to pump everybody up. So I did that for a few years and then got promoted again. And then I ended up in the more of the management level of things. Someone said that, oh, you got potential, son. I'm like, yeah, OK, great. So I want more money and uh, got promoted and I moved to a wholly different section. It was program management and it was that team environment, that cohesion, that, that trust your brother element was gone. 
And we were just starting to have remote working back then. So my boss lived in Maryland. One of my teammates worked next to me in a cube. We had a cube farm of like 50 cubes, just like you could, you know, just like Mm -hmm. go everywhere. Uh, One person lived in Arizona. So we were all over the place and we would travel a lot. And that was fun. That taught me a lot about being corporate. But what it came down to, Scott, which really drove me away from it was I couldn't count on my buddy. I couldn't count on my teammates because they were all only worried about their own projects and the programs that they were working on. And they wanted to look good and they weren't going to help me. I was a new guy. I'd never done anything like that before and got no help, got no support. And I realized it was doggy dog. And that's, that's not the environment I came from in the military. It was, Hey, you know, we're all in this together. And so after five years, I got out, I, I cashed out right before MCI went bankrupt. So a lot of my friends, my, my, my bosses got really screwed um, because the stock price went from like 77 to seven cents. Wow. And I, I, I peaked out uh, and, and I had MCI to thank for this one that, and two, I won a couple of contests and programs and they sent me to um, Puerto Rico and it was an island off the coast of Puerto Rico. It's a private resort. The El Conquistador is this name something else now. But we had a private island. We had jet skis and everything. It was like a week of congratulations. You did really good. You made a lot of money. Go have some fun. And so there are like 75 people that they send to this thing from all over the world. I think um, uh, they would have... Dara Torres, who was an Olympic swimmer, came one year. They have all these, you know, celebrities come and do motivational speeches for you and everything. So it was kind of a big deal. Had to get a tux and everything and all this awards banquet and stuff. And I I come back and I'm still working for MCI. And I realize that there's my answer. I don't want this MCI thing anymore. I can't, I can't, I can't deal with these people. They, they don't, they don't have ethics when it comes to <laughs> being a team sure. and I went back to the Virgin Islands and that's that's when I quit and uh went to the Virgin Islands just checked out so you just picked up and moved I mean it, it was just uh and, and honestly <laughs> if they didn't have that that uh that banquet in Puerto Rico you probably wouldn't have made that connection in your head that that's where you I wanted would- to be right I wouldn't have known what to do. So I'm sitting on the beach with my buddy, uh, JD Callahan, and we're just trying to sober up. And this dude comes walking down the beach with a spray bottle, with a trigger and a fan. And he, he walks up to us and he's like, would you like a spritz? I'm like, no, but I'd like your job. And he said, well, that's interesting you say that because I represent a company that just developed an eco-friendly sunscreen so it doesn't wash off and hurt the coral. So we're looking for sales reps all throughout the Virgin Islands. And I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And he's like, no, I'm serious. Here's my card. And I took his card. And I remember this. His name was Peter Crotty. It was a white card and had like this blue palm tree on it and everything. And I took that back to my desk and I looked at it for weeks. And I finally called him. And I'm like, I'm ready. And that's the I got down there and we had made friends. Some of my buddies who went down there made friends with uh, the locals. So the, 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 the bag, the little bag people who, when you go there and they take your luggage, they were, we were like, Hey, show us where to go hang out. So we ended up hanging out with them when we were down there. So I had that connection. So I would still call back to Puerto Rico. And because I worked for a phone company, I would connect my friend down there to his mom up in Boston. I'm like, Oh, Hey man, I'll put you through. I put him through. Um, and so we just maintained that connection. So he said, so are you, are you ever coming down here? And I'm like, yeah, I'm coming down. And so he hooked me up. He's like, come on down to El Conquistador. You can have a job doing what I'm doing. And so I'm thinking, Hey, yeah, 10 bucks an hour on the beach, all these you know people in bikini. I'm like, I'm in and I get down there and I'm waiting for him to bring his boss out. And I'm just kind of sitting in my car in the parking lot and waiting. And then I see like six of these little people run out of the hotel lobby, stand up and line up on the curb. And they're all wearing this like, you know, tropical shirt, short tan pants, and they all match. And I think, oh, that would be my job because there was a bus coming. They were going to unload the bus. I'm like, I can do that. But then, Scott, I looked and it freaked me out. Because it reminded me of 
military uniforms, standing in formation. And I'm like, no, I'm getting that. That's, I got away from that. So I put the car in drive and left right there. Okay. I didn't even say goodbye. I went right back to the airport and uh, called a friend of mine and said, hey, I'm down in the Virgin Islands and what do I do now? And someone said, go to St. John. So I ended up going to St. John and worked on a dive boat. But here's something good about transitions and the military. I go to this place and it's a job board and I look and there's a job for a dive shop manager. I'm like, hey, I've got management experience and I've always wanted to dive. James Bond was a big diver. I love that stuff. So I'm totally qualified. Had never even dove in my life. So I walk in, this dude, his name is Bob Carney. Bob goes, so, uh, you know, you're in the, yeah, he looked at my resume. Oh, so you're in the army, huh? I'm like, yeah. Like, oh, you in Desert Storm, huh? Yeah. Well, I was Navy. <laughs> oh, instantly right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I see the Navy flag in behind you. And even though there's a whole Army Navy rivalry and yeah. you know different jobs and stuff, we had that instant connection. He could trust me and he sure. believed in, in, in bringing me on. And so he did. He brought me on. A week later, I'm on a dive boat in the Virgin Islands thinking, all right, uh, cash out MCI. I've got I've got my military connection back and I'm loving life. And yeah. that, that transition there, it paid off after all those years. Uh, that, yeah. yeah, it's interesting how that kind of came around and, um, mm. you know, j fortunate timing, I guess, with uh, the MCI. I mean, not for everybody else, but for you to, you know, just have, happen to line up with, you know, the yeah. being able to cash out and, um, you know, come out ahead on all of that and not lose everything, right? Um, I got lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, a great way to uh kind of uh, kind of cash out and kind of wash your hands of that and not have to look back and have any regrets at it either you know um so you did that for a little while um and you ended up coming back working for the military again is that right you, you ended up going back doing kind of intelligence support yep. I, yeah yeah i ended up coming back um, my dad, uh, had some, had an illness and I needed to be back in the States. And that was just kind of a, that was kind of clean my mind trip. And, uh, so I did that for a while, loved it, but I came back and nine 11 happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're talking about at that point. And I really, I was just kind of living the beach life still. Uh, and nine 11 happened and I, it hit me. I'm like, I'm not doing the right thing with my life. Yeah. I've got to get back involved in something. And I considered CID again, and I had a packet, had a complete packet to join a reserve unit. I was living in Kentucky at the time uh, at Le in Lexington, super place. And um, they were going to bring me in. And it was either that or become a cop. And again, that was still came around. So I ended up becoming a cop. And that was, that was super for me. Um, but right before during that transition period is when I got into writing <clears throat> because 9-11 happened and I found myself needing something to do, mm -hmm. something positive to contribute. And the only thing I could think of right then was to write a book about all of these new service members who were signing up into the military and they're going off to Afghanistan to go get Osama bin Laden back then. And I wanted to write something to help explain to everyone else still back in the States what these kids went through to get to where they're going. So basic training. And I thought instead of doing just like a, like a chronological, this is what basic training is like. And I'll list it that way. I thought that would be boring. And the, the writer, uh, David Sedaris was really popular at the time. And so I thought, well, let's do something funny. Let's do it. Let's make it satirical so that people will find it interesting and want to read it because of that. And at the same time, they'll still learn something and understand and appreciate what all of these 18 to 22 year old kids are doing right now by signing up because recruiting was off the charts after 9 11. Yeah. And I wanted, uh, that was my contribution. So I wrote a book called Yes Drill Sergeant and went on some radio shows back then where you actually had to go to the station and sit down <laughs> and talk to people. 
And I was I was writing other military members and other retirees and, and people like that just to get some momentum for the book and get some blurbs. I got some great blurbs from people like Jamie Farr, who was Clinger on MASH. Bill Murray from Strites wrote me a letter back and said, oh, yeah, basic training. You thought that was funny, huh? Um, and one of the guys I got a letter back from uh, was a graphic artist. And so I asked him to do my cover for me. So he started working on the cover and he said, you know what? This book should go to my cousin. Uh, who was in Germany and his cousin ended up being an air force retiree from uh, special police for, for, for air force. And he worked for U S army Europe headquarters at that point. And he was the anti-terrorism policy guy. So I sent him my book and said, here, my guy says, you know, I thought it'd be great. And I had my former commander from desert storm, write the forward for me, which is another great thing. Cause I just asked him for a blurb and he wrote a, like a six page four. Oh, wow. Like in his three star general. And I'm like, I can't believe he had time to do that. And but he did. General John Sylvester, super guy, love him to death, wrote me this forward. And that was in the book that I sent to Germany. It went to this guy named Phil. Phil read the book and he's like, Oh, this is great. General Sylvester wrote the forward. So he took the book, walked into General Sylvester's office, who was the chief of staff of UCOM at the time, United States European Command. And he's like, hey, you know this guy, Jeff Circle? <laughs> it's just so crazy. that and once you have that military connection, hang on to it. Oh, yeah. Because there's an advantage to it. So, you know, six degrees of separation, you know, General Sylvester goes, yeah, he was, yeah, I wrote the forward. He was, he was one of my guys in, in Desert Storm. And so this guy, Phil, he's, a, he's an American contractor, worked in anti-terrorism, ended up offering me a job. Okay. And so that's how I ended up. And I started off going to Italy. He said, Hey, I've got well, one position open in Italy. Uh, it's for a mid-level uh, anti-terrorism uh, uh, analyst policy. You can go work for us. You work at us army Europe headquarters in, uh, or us army Africa headquarters in Vicenza. I did that for a year. Loved it. Italy was fantastic. But then uh, a higher position came open the next year for the next contract year in Heidelberg. So I did the same thing in, in Heidelberg okay. uh, for U.S. Army Europe. So just the six degrees were amazing. Yeah. You just don't give up and still reach out and make those contacts. And they'll pay off. And, and it's interesting how you just started writing for, you know, looking for some positivity, right? And then that led to this unexpected career change for you, right? You, you weren't expecting to wind up in Italy or, you know, anywhere over there. Like it just wound up working out that way. Um, yeah. And so I, I want to talk about the, the writer's uh, dossier uh, that, okay. that you've been, uh, you know, working with for a little while now. You, you have uh, a couple authors that are on there that um, are former guests on this show, which is kind of cool. Um, Let me and, see. Have you had Steve, who have you had? Have you had on Steve Stratton Steve or Stratton. Ward Larson? Yep, Steve Stratton. Um, I think. Um, I think there is uh, Jeff Clark. I think is another one on there. Yeah. That- yep. Jeff. Jeff's a great dude. We're yeah. We're we're yeah. tied in together. Yeah. Um, I want to say there was one or two others, and I can't remember off the top of my head. I don't have the list in front of me right now of everybody who is on there. But um, but regardless. Um, pretty cool uh you know make again there's here's another connection where we're coming uh kind of full circle here with all of this so tell us a little bit about it and what it is and and uh you know what what the idea was behind it when you you set it up and what it is now yeah yeah so um i retired from contracting that my last gig was a, a, a counterintelligence mission in afghanistan ran that for a few years fantastic after Kabul fell got out um, and had to make another transition. So naturally drive on. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to get into military writing. Uh, I always been a writer. I always loved it. I always had these connections going all the way back to, you know, desert storm. Uh, I was the writer. Um, and so cobble falls, I had been writing a book and I wanted to finish it. So I did. And then what do you do? I've got a book. I got to try to sell it. I've got to find an agent and find a publisher and all this stuff. Well, in the meantime, I wrote another book while the first one was being edited. And then I got that done. I'm like, well, what next? So now I find myself in a pool of other writers who have finished books 
who have either gone a self-publishing route and are you know, selling their books and trying to get you know traction and and and, and attention that way, uh, or I'm just in a holding pattern and I'm waiting. Yeah, you know, and and that's miserable. Yeah. The query process, the submission process, the wait, the never hearing back. Uh, there's stories behind that, lots of them. So in the meantime, I thought again, I want to give back. I want to do something to help all these other writers who I've I've kind of started following and I've I've met you know mostly virtually at that point. And one day it just hit me, my Intel background. I want to create a dossier and help use my platform on social media to promote these other writers who I've met in the process who have helped me with my writing. And so I, I, I downloaded a graphic that's, that's the dossier graphic. Um, it's just like a file folder mm-hmm. and I put top secret on it and I put their picture and I make it look like a real intelligence, you know, piece of intelligence, like a, a dossier file and some information about them. And I collect the information from an interview that I do with them. And so, uh, I got, I, I got to have this graphic and then I'll shoot them some questions. But again, instead of those traditional boring questions of tell me about your writing process, where do you get your ideas? What inspires you? Where do you write all those things? Those are all the same questions. I went completely different direction and I decided to make it funny and satirical and be a little off the wall with the questions, but they're each customized based on what I know of the person, what I've learned to, uh, from them over the time being together and, and, and their, and, and their topic of what they're writing. And, and so it's usually five questions, uh, that are totally customized to them and they tell they send me the answers and I put it on my website, the writers dossier.com. And I push that out on social media and I just promote, 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 promote them. And it pays off for me because I learned from them. And I develop a relationship with them. And it, again, it goes back to that, those military connections that, that, that help feed you mm-hmm. and give you and ground you to a purpose. And we're, again, now I'm in an environment where we're all in this together. The Steve Strattons, all these other people who are, are working hard to, to, to send a message through, through their books. And so the dossier, yeah. Uh, yeah. I started it in August of last year. I launched that. And then I went to BoucherCon, which is a big writer's conference every year. This year it was in San Diego. And I walk in, Scott, it was the weirdest thing. Because as a, as a Intel guy, a counter Intel guy, I'm not, I'm not on the headlines. You know, this whole social media thing was new for the first year of hey, you're putting all your personal information out there. Yeah. <laughs> I walk in and I've got a name tag. And I see somebody, I, it, it, was, it was Steve Stratton was standing next to Jack Stewart, um, Michael Carlson, and uh, another a couple other people. And I just held up the name tag, it said Jeff Circle. And Steve came over, there's Jeff Circle, he's with the dossier. And so now all these people, they, they, they know me from, from X and Facebook and Instagram. And that was so wonderful to kind of have a group of people back again. Mm-hmm. And it's it's exploded since then. Um, uh, I think we've done sixty dossiers. Uh, we just we, we we celebrate our fiftieth with Tori Eldridge, who writes these ninja books. Um, and I keep it to military thrillers or thrillers in general, but I've expanded it out to crime, mystery, suspense. There are some great writers out there, and a lot of them, a lot of them have have the military background, like like I was talking about. Like like you had Steve on; he's got these shadow. Si- Tier series, uh, Ward's deep fake, uh, Ward Larson, Air Force guy, um, DCR, uh, so many, so many people I, I've run into who are doing exactly what I'm doing uh, with trying to get book, get a book published. But in the meantime, I'm like, hey, let's let's help you out. Let's 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 promote you. That's what yep. the dossier does. And that's uh, t- taking it back to the military. You know, that's that one team mentality, everyone's in it, you know, we're all trying to achieve the same thing. Um, you know, if one writer sells a copy of their book, it's not taking away from another writer because at some point, whoever bought that book, they're going to finish it and they're going to be looking for another book to, to, to read. Right. And so yeah. when all of you, all, you, you people come together and you're, you're helping each other out because I got to imagine, um, 
you help out one writer and that other writer is going to start seeing, you know, the benefits of, of that in their own, uh, you know, book sales and things like that. And they're going to start helping other people and they're going to, they're going to be able to, uh, you know, kind of cross promote different things, especially within very similar genres of, of books. Um, you know, you, you finish reading one author's books, uh, you're going to be looking for something else. Well, hey, guess what? There's this other author here who ha- writes something in you know the similar space here. So, um, you know, help help each other out, right? I think that's that's a great way this, to go about it, right? Yeah, this group is is incredible when it comes to uh, collaboration with each other. And here's a little inside baseball for you, Scott. The other genres are not like it. And what I mean is like the thriller, crimes, mystery and suspense people, um, I can text everyone I, I, I've, I've done dossiers with and we'll get we'll, we'll get something going back and forth. That's the, that genre. The military genre is even tighter. The romance yeah. writers, they hate each other. <laughs> you know, it's like I hear I hear this at conferences. Um, this is the only genre, the thriller genre, mystery, crime, and suspense, um, where, yeah, the writers are actually friends. They get yeah. together. They actually get together. They, they do this thing called Noir at the Bar, and they will go and they'll read their work, and there'll be like six or seven of them together. They'll all help each other. And even people who don't have military connections, uh, but they still write good stuff. I've done dossiers on them. And you know, we've had lots of conversations since then. And you know, the nice thing is they've actually helped me a little bit. And I'm like, hey, I've got a chapter. What, what, can I send it to you? You know, will you give me your feedback. And I've never gotten a no. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and, you know, and and they'll they'll contact me and they'll say, hey, hey, I've got my my book's going into paperback. Can you shoot out it? You know, can you update the dossier or hey, I have a new author photo? You know, so it, we're constantly in contact. And it's really cool to see everyone's career just kind of come and go and where they are and and how we all work together. It is so fulfilling. That's cool. Yeah. And, and just seeing that progression, right. And even, you know, again, taking it back to the military as an NCO, you see, you know, the, the junior enlisted who are just coming in They're they're fresh and, you know, maybe they, they, uh, they're not quite, hundred percent there. And, and you see their career start progressing, you know, as you're moving up the ranks, they're moving up the ranks and, and it's, it's cool to see, you know, that at some point they become the leaders and yeah. they, they, they have their own squad or whatever that they're, they're running. And you get to see that in, in those people. But um, you know, it's very similar probably with, with these books is you, you may get a, uh, you know, relatively new author who, is getting getting their stuff out there and and then they start they write that second book and the third book and they 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 continue yeah. to progress in their career and it's cool to see them progress and see how uh you know you've you've played a, a you know at least a small part in what it is that they are accomplishing right and being proud for them for their accomplishments yeah that's right yeah 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 uh, yeah absolutely um that uh you know it like I said before, their accomplishments don't take anything away from you and your colleagues and, and the other folks who are, are writing, you know. Now, you you kind of explained your journey, how you got into writing. Um, and mm-hmm. that was very fortunate, I think, that you had the, the ability to make those connections. You kept some of those military connections and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, for other folks out there, other veterans who – want to jump into writing, um, you know, in any genre, uh, of, of book. Um, do you have any advice for them? What, what can you do to encourage folks to get involved in, in that? Yeah. See, I've had so many people, uh, say, Oh, I want to be a writer or I've got a book in my head. So many people. And, and that's why it's so hard to break into because there are a lot of people who want to break in. Yeah. So I, I'm not really good at writer's advice. I don't think because my, my perspective is who am I? (laughs) Okay. But from what I've learned, I've got some good things to tell you. First thing is you've got to write. So many people say, I have a book I've been thinking about and that's as far as it's gotten. And that's, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. The motivation has to come in from you. 
And, you know, with the military background and, and, and the, the, the drive on attitude, the spirit, uh, you've got to just do it. You've got to yep. put pen to paper, fingers to keyboards, whatever it is, you have to write. And the other thing is a lot of people will think that, you know, hey, I can start, I can write a book and they haven't really read much because mm. it takes time and, and there's a lot going on in our lives. Most of your first time writers, your debut authors have been at it for 20 years. They started reading Tom Clancy when we were in, in the military and they loved it and they fell in love with books and reading. I have always had books around me my whole life. I, I, I would collect them just because I liked them when I was a kid. And I didn't, didn't read it. They weren't all, you know, nine year old appropriate, but um, you, you've got to love books and you've got to, you've got to embrace the, the, the process. And the process is understand how a book is written. Um, you know, there's a, there's a beginning, middle and end. Uh, you have an idea. But then you've got to build that out. Um, you've got to actually do it. And then you, you've got to read. You, mm -hmm. and, and not to get ideas to copy, but to understand how a story in a book works. And that's, that's some of the challenge. So what, I, what I'd recommend, it's, it's, it's really popular advice, is start off with Stephen King's on writing. Because a lot of people think they can write. I thought I could write when I sat down after Desert Storm. And, oh, I'm going to do this, you know, this funny basic training book. Uh, but it was a whole lot different than the writing that I had done in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. uh, so start to write, but get some instructions too. Because don't think that you can do what everyone else who's really good at it can do. Without some kind of practice and without some type of education. And you'll get that if you if you you know look at on writing and there are other books out there too. Don't get stuck studying the whole time. You've got to write too, and that's where people get bogged down. Then it starts to become oh I really can't do this because there is a lot to it. So I my advice is this to top it off, write for yeah. fifteen minutes a day, or a paragraph a day, or a page a day. Set a goal. And I've heard people do the math. If you write 2,000 words a day, you know, your, your book will be done in four months, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to start somewhere. When yeah. People get, want to get, get into it. That's, that's the first thing I say. You've got to start. You've got to write. You've got to learn about writing. And you've got to keep writing. And then, then you'll learn. And then, then you're going to throw that first book away, probably. Most people do. <laughs> or totally rewrite it. Sure. Because what we have in our head doesn't work out. But seek out people like, like me, uh, other people who you can make contacts with, like, especially if you have a military background, there are a lot of military writers out there. Mm -hmm. And I heard Matt Quirk, Matthew Quirk wrote the night agent. Um, he wrote uh, inside threat. He, he said once, and, and I met him in San Diego. He said, most of us writers are, are, are quiet people sitting on our keyboard by ourselves, solitary doing our work. We're just happy to hear that someone wants to talk to us. <laughs> So reach out to, you know, if there's a genre you're interested in, if there's a particular writer or a topic who a writer that writes in a topic, contact them. Just DM them on, 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 you know, X or, or Instagram or whatever. Most everyone will respond. Yeah. If you throw that line out, if you, th if you send five messages out, you'll get back four. Right. Yeah. And I guess the, the worst case scenario is they, they don't get back to you or they say, no, not interested, whatever. Okay, cool. Move on. Yeah. Find somebody else. You know, So and, many good people out there who will respond and, and they want to help. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, but your, your advice I think is, is really great because, it, you know, think about, um, you know, doing something like learning how to play golf. You can watch Tiger Woods play golf all you want. Um, you're not going to, you're not going to be, shooting 300 yard drives, uh, you know, with, with, uh, you know, just by watching, uh, how it's done, you're going to have to get out there and actually do it. And, and it's like a muscle that has to get practiced. And, yeah. um, you know, yeah. Watching the videos are great because it gives you an idea. Like this is the ballpark of where you need to be kind of shooting for, but going out and then translating into that, to actually doing it, um, is a different thing. So that's kind of like reading the books and, getting idea of, okay, how, how are these characters developed? How is the story, you know, you know, developed and all these things that, that go from the beginning, the middle, the end of the yeah, book. How do you, how do you start a chapter? How do you end a chapter? Yeah. 
And and how do you wrap up the book? Like, where, where you can't just be just put a big the end at the end of the book and be like, that's it. You know, like you, you kind of have to conclude things too, and and yeah. uh, wrap it up. Unless you're unless you're leaving a cliffhanger for the second uh, second uh, book that might be coming out. But um, you know, but still, that takes some planning and, and writing will help to. Uh, kind of develop that muscle that you need to develop as you're you're going along. So, um, you know, I I do like to encourage people though who might feel like they have a story in them of any genre that it doesn't matter. Um, you know, you, you're talking about thriller, mystery, crime, suspense uh, novels. Um, you know, it could be anything uh, that that you have in you. Um, you know, tell the story. Um, even even uh, nonfiction uh, writers, yeah. um, you know, and, and maybe in, even in some cases, especially nonfiction writers, because you may have a story that you took part in. This is a story of something yeah. that you uh, happened to you. And it may be just a way for you to share that with the world where otherwise those stories get lost to history. Right. And it is um, powerful. yeah, yeah. yeah well, exactly. Jeff, Jeff Clark. Jeff Clark did a nonfiction book on leadership that he learned from all his years in the military. Yeah. 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 Share, yeah. We've got stuff to share. Let's share it. Exactly. Yeah. It, put them out there um, because, um, and, and he, even if you write it in, in a, you know, a story, a personal story that happened to you in a, uh, you know, a fictional way, you know, like you just kind of relate those, uh, those lessons learned or the experiences that you had and stuff like that. But you don't want to say, Hey, this is me. And this is what happened to me, whatever, who cares? Like get it out there and share that story so that other people can experience those, those things as well. Um, good, bad, and different doesn't matter. Uh, I think those things help us, uh, like we were saying at the beginning of the episode helps us to understand, uh, other humans and other understand what those people are going through, what they've experienced in their lives. And, um, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, even in suffering, we still have something that we can learn. And, and, uh, you know, you shared some of those stories, uh, you know, at the beginning of this episode. And, and I think that's, uh, just a great way to, uh, get that out there, uh, in a, in a, uh, format that will stand the test of time. It'll, it'll survive, uh, even long past, past us. So, you know, I think it's a great way to do it. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so for the folks who are interested in learning more about the, the writer's dossier, um, and what you, what you do and maybe finding out more about some of the authors who we talked about today, uh, where can people go to find out more about that and, and get that information? Yeah. Um, uh, my website is jeffcircle.com, but I've got a special link. The writer's dossier.com goes straight to the list of uh, everyone who I've interviewed. So it's on the web. Um, uh, I'm bigger on X uh, than I am Instagram because I can, I can do more with it by promoting more, more things out with links and things like that. But I'm on Instagram x facebook threads I, i'm linkedin I'm, I'm i'm everywhere um anywhere i can get the message out uh about these writers i, I send things out so follow me there you'll see one I, i've been doing about two a week uh i did a big uh holiday blast where i sent out uh one every day like the eight days of christmas almost <laughs> um and so i i've done something else too with people who haven't gotten books out there's a page uh, called the the dossier watch list. So uh, someone who's struggling, a struggling writer who isn't quite there yet, or maybe they have an agent and they're just waiting or they, wherever they are, if they're not published, I do a thing called the dossier watch list. And it's a little different. The graphic is a different color and it's a little less information. It's not a full interview of a dossier, but it's just to get someone's name out there, just to get their image out there, their, their book title and where they are and their process and help get traction followers for them too. They're not quite there yet, but they're getting there. And I see real promise in some of these uh, people on the watch list. So the writers dossier.com or jeffcircle.com. Yeah, that's perfect. And and for those folks who are in that that situation that you just described, where they they haven't gotten that traction yet, uh, this is a great way to get that traction um, even before that first book comes out. Um, oh yeah, get, you've got to be rolling. Yeah, you, you got to hit 
hit the ground running with that. You know, you, you have to have, uh, you know, let people know who, who is this person even? Why do I care that this person has a book out? What, what are they, what types of things do they write about? What types of things are, are they, uh, you know, going to bring to the table when I pick up this book? So, uh, so that's a interesting way to go about getting these people, uh, you know, up and running right, right off the bat. Yeah. So, so pretty cool. Yeah. Get some exposure because a lot of people want to write a book and they think that's it, but there's so much more to it. You've got to sell it. You've got to sell yourself. You've got to market yourself. You got to have a network of people who are going to help you. And you know, the exposure is so important. Um, a lot yeah. of people have really hit a wall after they got their first. Now what? You no, know, you're just starting at that point. Yeah. I, I, I said in, in with the book that I wrote, um, writing the book was the easiest part. It was the promoting the book afterwards that was yeah. was difficult. Um, well, that's what the dossier is for. We we help promote, yeah. and it's yeah. just, I do it just for fun. Just getting getting the word out there and letting people know about it. it, it just you underestimate how much uh, time <laughs> and effort and energy and uh, you know all this stuff that goes into it. Uh, it. It's it's a lot. So this is definitely an awesome uh, way to go. Um, you know, especially for those writers who are you know, just dipping their toe in the water and, uh, you know, getting, you know, wanting to get a little bit more exposure. Um, you're, you're probably underestimating the amount of work that it takes. And, and this is, this is a great service that you're, you're providing to, to those folks. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, and, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, just a, a really cool thing and, and keeps that community and that, that camaraderie, uh, like you might've, uh, been been missing from getting yeah. out uh, when, when you're getting out from the uh, military, right? Yeah. When things go sideways, will you be prepared? Some people are concerned they might have to go for a long time without electricity or even food. That's why I want to introduce you to 4 Get preparedness products you can use now and that could save your life later. My favorite is 4Patriots new solar generator, the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. It uses the endless free power of the sun to power lights, your TV, medical equipment, even run your fridge. Plus, it's expandable and comes with a free solar panel. Or pick up one of 4Patriot's best-selling survival food kits. Delicious tasting and designed to last for 25 years. They even have kits with real meat, and if the power's out, no worries. Just boil water over a fire, simmer, and serve. You'll enjoy a hot meal and stay safe in a crisis. More smart people than ever are finding poor patriots. Over 2 million customers trust them. And you might have even seen them on TV. I had the folks at 4Patriots set up a special page for you at 4Patriots.com forward slash drive on so that listeners of this podcast can see this week's discounts and deals before they go away. Go to 4Patriots.com forward slash drive on. But hurry, these deals won't last long. Save more and get peace of mind now by going to 4Patriots.com forward slash drive on so um well at this point in the show i like to end the shows with a little bit of humor um based yes. on this conversation i have a feeling this is not going to be lost on you so uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so anyways this, this. <laughs> this segment is is something i call is it service connected um and it's a funny way to look at some some videos of service members doing something stupid getting injured you know doing doing things that not not too seriously injured that you're not falling out of a helicopter or anything like that but you know just doing something that um you know generally uh we can laugh at and uh we can take a laugh and and then we can also take a look at it and say you know would this person qualify for some sort of service connected disability somewhere down the line um and it's it's always a uh I, I always do this when there's another veteran on uh, on the show on the other end here, and I can't think of a single time where the other the other veteran wasn't laughing. So I've already looked at some of these videos and I've already laughed. So um, might as well share the laughter for the folks who are listening to the audio podcast. Sorry, you're not be able to watch it unless you go check us out on YouTube or X and uh, check out the videos there where where we post them. Um, but if you've gotten this far, uh, you're, you're already committed on the audio, but but you can definitely check it out on, on those platforms anyway. So let me pull up this video for you to uh, take a look at, um, share it on, on your end. And this video right now, I'll try to describe it for the audio listeners. Uh, looks like there's a, there's a woman, maybe an instructor of some sort, standing behind a soldier who, I don't know, appears to be down on his knees. So 
that's, I, I don't know. Let's see what, what's going to happen. She's standing behind him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's not really not much else to describe on this. I mean, there's, yeah, a little background stuff, but it's kind of irrelevant. So, so let's go ahead and take a take a look at uh, what's going on with this video. All right. Okay. So she got her. She's choking him out. Looks like like she's yeah, doing an instructions, um, you know, on how to put the crook of her arm under his neck, her other hand behind his head, and she's. He seems okay right now. I mean, she's not really putting much pressure on him. He's okay now. There's a little pressure, and. Let's he's see. Got he's going he's, down. Oh my God, he's limp now. There he goes. Uh, yep. <laughs> and good night. And good night. He is out. And they're trying to oh. they're trying to wake him back up. Um, Outstanding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, I don't think he was expecting that. Um, I don't think anyone like, hey, volunteer to be like the 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 test dummy on this. I don't think anyone's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'm gonna get choked out by this by this uh you know person who's who's demonstrating. And I'm gonna be. Well, she you know, didn't wiped have out. it. She was. She had. She was under the chin, but she. She. She wasn't catching both carotids. I think she finally got it in, locked she, it in enough, and, and he, she finally. She put the pressure. That I think where yeah. she had it was like the pressure on the back of the head, you know, and then pushed down into it, and yeah. that's that's what got him on on both sides there. And uh, hey, there, there's there's nothing like that feeling right before you pass out. <laughs> oh my gosh! So I was in basic training um, at Fort Benning. Um, and we finished our, the, 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 uh, final ruck march that we did. Um, it was like 12 miles or I forget how long it was. It was something crazy, stupid like that. Right. And so, um, we get to the end and we're all standing in formation and I, I don't know if my knees were locked. I don't know what it was, but I just started seeing the world start to close in. Yeah. And then I, you know, you're standing in formation in basic training. You're not supposed to say a damn thing anyways, right? Uh, I, I remember just turning to the guy next to me and go, I'm going down. And <laughs> the next thing I know, I wake up. I'm at the back of the formation sitting on the on the ground. Someone had, you know, grabbed me and dragged me back. But I just, I went flat on my face. I just went oh. timber right down. It's it's the feeling of, of that is just... <laughs> Uh, if you haven't experienced it, I don't. Well, it's, it. it's, it's, it's the time you don't. One when you come out of it, you don't know what how much how much time's passed. It's the weirdest feeling when you come out of it too. And I think every basic training unit has that. And we had people pass out. It's yeah. like you know they're locked up. Don't bend your knee. And and the thing was, I was. I was not the only one who was sitting behind the formation uh, when I when I came to. There was there was like yeah. I think. There's like two or three of us who are sitting behind the formation, and, and this is a group of like 50 guys. So it's it's like, you know, we're at like five percent of the the platoon was was passing out because definitely you know. service related. You're yeah. doing the right thing. Yeah, I think uh, you know that that could have been a service connected uh, type of thing. Um, okay. And one thing I, I say with all these people, thank God they have it on video. So if they need evidence, they have it on, <laughs> they have video evidence. They can submit that uh, for their claims. So um, anyways, Jeff, thank you for taking the time to join me and sharing what you're doing now with uh, uh, all these writers, sharing their their stuff and getting it out there to uh, to the masses. I really do appreciate you sharing that and sharing your background and, and everything that you've uh, you've done along the way. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to come on. You're welcome, Scott. And then thank you for what you do with the drive on podcast, promoting military experiences, making connections. Uh, I know it's a labor of love. Uh, my, my work is too, but Hey, I look at it now. I know I can text you in a heartbeat and, and we can get something going on. So I'm mm -hmm. always here for you. And, uh, I look forward to being on next time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for listening to the Drive On Podcast. If you want to support the show, please check out Scott's book, Surviving Son, on Amazon. All of the sales from that book go directly back into this podcast and work to help veterans in need. You can also follow the Drive On Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts.